Hi, I'm Garrett with IDC Woodcraft, and I'm really glad you've come to this video, especially if you are someone who has done some CNC router projects, and as your project is cut in, you find that your router bit is digging deeper and deeper and deeper into your project, eventually ruining it, and you don't understand what's going on. Well, what's happening is your router bit is actually moving in the collet. It's slipping downward. And I'm going to explain to you why. Did you ever notice when you take your router bit off, you got all kinds of sawdust in the nut like that and on the collet like that and you pull the collet out and you got sawdust all over it like that and you also have sawdust inside the shaft which we never see well, this sawdust is the culprit and we're going to talk about this now i've shot a video about this before but it was really at a surface level so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this down to the engineering level as to what's really going on I've been in CNC machining for a very long time in my career and engineering, and we had to deal with stuff like this all the time. And usually, the problems that we think it is, isn't. It goes a lot deeper. So, this video is going to explain to you why your router bit slips and what you need to do to stop it from happening. We're going deep, so get ready. What we're going to do first is I'm going to talk to you about the holding method of your router bit in your router with the collet because it's important to set that stage so you understand where I'll be going to when I start explaining why this slippage stuff is happening and then we'll get into all the different reasons why it could be happening or the compound effect of these different reasons why your router bit is moving in your project while it's being cut and unfortunately ruining it because we're going to save your awesome projects from now on so without further ado we're going to start talking about the holding and then we're going to get to the problems so let's go okay so what we're going to do here is we are going to talk about this setup of how the router bit gets clamped into the router itself and we're going to talk about the problems that actually come up what is it that makes your router bit move over the course of a project so we'll get to those in just a little bit first i just want to make sure you understand why a collet is a collet and how it works so there are four components to this whole setup as you can see you've got the router bit the collet the nut and the shaft the router bit has a straight shaft and inside the collet is a straight hole that's just over the size of the router bit on the outside of the collet is a taper and inside the router itself is a matching taper so when the collet goes into the router that taper surface makes contact with the collet and then you have the nut and the nut serves to push the collet up into the router the nut is the thing that applies all the force all right so let's get into a collet and how it works and why a collet is a collet the way it's designed so first of all, we well, have the hole inside, which is just slightly oversized of the diameter of the router bit. So it can slip in there, and it's kept to a tolerance of maybe a thousandth or two thousandths of an inch, so that the collet itself doesn't have much travel before it starts to grip the body. And then of course on the collet you have the slots, so you can have that springiness so that the collet can actually move inward to grip the bit itself. Now on the collet, we have a taper, we have a straight area, we've got this little thing, we've got the slots. A collet only grips where the surface of the router inside this shaft makes contact with the collet itself on a taper. And so you can see there is probably only six millimeters or a quarter of an inch worth of a taper here. So all the force that's holding your bit is right here. Meaning, when you tighten everything down, the only thing that's clamping your bit is from here to here. The rest of this is just material holding these pieces in place. 
They do not do any clamping whatsoever. So when the thing gets assembled and you screw the nut in, this part of the nut right here, this flange is pushing up on the collet and it's pushing the collet into the shaft of course and then the gripping takes place. Now I want to explain this to you so you understand how this works. You probably already know this but I'm going to do it anyway. So we have this collet and the collet shape has that particular shape. So it basically looks like this. And the nut flange is pushing up against the collet around the diameter. So the collet looks like that. It's got the slots in it. And the flange of the nut is right there in this area right here. So it's pushing the collet up on the outside. And there's the hole for the bit. The reason we have a taper is to apply a lot of force against the side of the bit that way. And this falls into trigonometry. So when we screw this nut up, it may move up an um, uh, eighth of an inch, we'll say. So when you put this guy in, into the collet, and the nut starts to move up, it moves not even an eighth of an inch, maybe a sixteenth of an inch, but it, just a small amount. And it's starting to put force on it as it screws up. So we got this upward force going against the collet. Now, you can maybe get 20 pounds of force on the turn. It's called torque. So you have about 20 pounds ultimately being applied around this entire diameter. That's 20 pounds upwards. On the side, we have multiples of that force because of the nature of the taper. So if we looked at this from the inside of the router shaft like that, we've got this angle. If we drew that up into a triangle, it looks something like that. These two lines are what they call vector forces. And what's happening, we are going up maybe a sixteenth of an inch. It's the same thing. Uh, well, let's just say that sixteenth of an inch works out to 20 pounds. We have 20 pounds of force here we have a multiple of forces here based on that angle and we'll just say 250 pounds it's in relationship to the length of this so if this that length and you just kind of do the same measurement down there so 150 pounds basically it's like this this is the force upward 20 pounds that's the force inward and it's shown by the length of the line so we've that little bit of movement from the nut is putting all that force inward to squeeze this collet down against the diameter of the router, of the router bit. So that's why when you actually insert this by hand and just turn it up by hand and just get it to hold, you know, you already can't pull that router bit out, but you know it's not nearly tight enough yet. That's because even with that half a pound of force that you have screwed this nut on with, you've already applied 20 pounds of force around the diameter of the collet. Now there's another thing about the collet. Why do we have a round hole on it and that hole goes virtually all the way around other than where the slots are? It's because we are able to apply force around the entire circumference of the bit. So let's just say this is the collet again and when that taper pushes in all the way around we have even force all the way around this bit or the collet onto the bit and it springs in because of the slots gives it that flexibility so that is the way a collet works and that's why we have a round hole when you're clamping on a, a full round surface that's the best clamping you can possibly get without going into chemical bonds like glues and things like that. Okay, so now you understand why a collet is a collet and how it works. And now 
With that understanding, you're going to start to understand why these problems come up where your router bit can actually slip in the collet despite how tight you've made it. So we're going to start drawing a new picture. And we'll cover the first one that's uh, the most common school of thought. And that is that we get so much sawdust in here that it collects up inside of these grooves here so much that we can't get compressibility. We can't get the squeeze in that taper. So that will have some effect, but you have to have a lot of sawdust. I mean, it has to be extremely tight. Almost, its strength has to be almost that of the steel in order to resist the forces that you are actually applying on it. And I want you to understand why. This will make sense to you later on as well. So steel has a crystal structure in it. And for simplicity, we're going to make it look like this. And crystal structures at the atomic level are very strong. Okay, that's very simple for steel, but that's going to suffice. When you have wood, okay, wood has very loose structures. So you may have an atom there, 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 and there. This has very little give, whereas this has all kinds of give because there is no structure behind it. So that atom can move in, that atom can move out, that atom can move out that way, that one can move in that way, and then when you let them go, it all bounces back. So you have a certain level of springiness or looseness to this chemical uh, at the chemi at the atomic level and you compound that with all kinds of atoms of the wood that's made of you've got a lot of springiness that can actually come into it relative to what you can get out of steel so when you get wood bound up in the slots it really takes a lot where you start to lose this springiness ability in the wood structure I know we're taking this deep, but this is the way this works. Having been in CNC machining for a long time and being at the, uh, an engineer for a long time and having to make sure we use the right materials for the right jobs and, and make sure that, that issues like sawdust aren't a problem and troubleshooting it, uh, you just learn about this stuff and, and, and have to take it into account. So sawdust between the, the tangs the slots in the slots the second one when you cut your projects you're making wood chips and you got these nice big chips and then you have dust laying around as well that's so it's you have wood chips you have sawdust and then you have really really fine sawdust if you finish a project and you take a, a microscope to your to your uh, sawdust you're gonna see there's super small pieces in there okay so that is so small that it can actually fit in between the router bit and that hole that to us it seems really snug already but to a piece of sawdust that big that's like a tunnel <laughs> the the holland tunnel going into new york city and again as you're taking things in and out you're moving that sawdust in and out of the of the collet as well as getting sawdust around this area as well so what happens with that is comes back to this whole animal here. You've got these small pieces of sawdust that are sitting inside of there. And while this router is turning and the bit is cutting wood and it's pushing, a, it has this resistance. It actually wants to flex. If it's cut in this way, it actually wants to flex backwards. So you have this tangential force again, these, these, that triangle force. So that's, you're actually getting a, a, a force that way. You're getting a force down or up. And you're also getting the torsional resistance. It, the bit does not want to turn through the material. It doesn't want to cut it. You have to use the, 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 the two horsepower of this machine in order to make that happen. So that resistance while it's turning and that torque is actually allowing that sawdust, those little tiny pieces that have gotten in between your bit and your collet and your collet and your router bit shaft, they start to roll around like ball bearings. And they give, right? They're getting so small, they give into the pores of the metal here and they just kind of roll around it. And so 
what happens over time is because of that like ball bearing effect, the router bit is slowly turning backwards or relative to the collet itself. And while it's rotating, there are some forces on it that's actually, it's going like that. So the forces are actually pulling the router bit down. And that's why you usually get downward digs in your projects. Think about it like this. You have a pillow in your hands and you can take that pillow and you can roll it back and forth. So if you just keep rolling, that pillow is just going to roll around and around and around. There, we'll take a shirt. Okay, so let's pretend this is that little tiny piece of many pieces of sawdust that's squeezed between the collet and the router bit. Now remember, the sawdust, the atomic structure, has springiness to it. We cannot physically, cannot compress it to the strength of steel. So it has given it, and as the rotation forces are being resisted, by the router bit because it's trying to cut through wood that resistance is translating back up to the router bit into the holding area of the collet and between the collet and the bit are these little pieces of wood and as that thing's turning this little piece of wood is slowly rolling through around over and over and how can it do that it can only do that because there's slippage going on so the router bit is slowly, this is the router bit, and it's pushing against it, and here's the collet, and it's resisting that, and so this is just slowly rolling around. And what that ends up doing is, as it's going with the other forces that are involved, it's rolling around, and it's pulling the bit down, because the bit is resisting, and it's flexing backwards. It actually has flex. You, you can sit there and try to bend a bit, and you can't get the flex out of it, but it does have flex. All bits have flex. So hopefully that makes a little more sense with the pillow or shirt analogy. A lot of engineering here. You are getting good level stuff and starting to understand this stuff at a deep level. Well, I hope you're starting to see the light in this. That usually the problems that we have are a lot deeper than what we realize up front. If you are starting to get some enlightenment out of this, give me a thumbs up. And I want to ask you to share this video with the Facebook groups. Because a lot of people have this problem and they don't understand what's going on. So I will ask you, please share this. And give it a like. You're really learning something deep here. But there's more to go. So let's get back into this. Alright, so we're going to take this to another level that is even far less understood. And is probably the same impact as the ball bearing effect. So let's say you you put this collet up into your router bit shaft, just like this, and there happens to be a little piece of sawdust right here and you go to tighten it up. What's happening? At a more exaggerated level is we're gonna draw this collet just like that. We're gonna draw this collet just like that. This essentially is what this collet looks like. And we just have that little piece right there. And we'll just say our tangs are coming around like this. So the tangs uh, are these guys here. You, you've got, this is a tang, that's a slot. So if we're looking at it from the bottom, we have our slot, 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 slot. And this little piece is sitting right up in here on that surface. When you go to tighten it up, the first thing it's doing is it's tr making contact with the sidewall of the router shaft here and the counter or opposing side which is right down here. So now we have contact being made here and here but we haven't made contact here or here yet as we're screwing it up. So as we tighten it this is starting to squeeze inward 
or these two tangs are starting to push inward, but these two are not yet. And so there's more force being applied here and here than there is here and here. And what we're doing now is we are eliminating or reducing the amount of holding force in this area here. And we're maintaining our holding force here and here. Basically, we can only squeeze it down far enough to clamp onto the bit, and there will be very little give after that. After that, it's just holding force. What we've done is we've lost 50% of our clamping ability, or 25% of our clamping force, because the majority of it is here and here, and not nearly as much here. And because of that, we are more susceptible to movement here because we are not on the full 100% even contact all the way around with even forces being clamped all the way around on the collet to the bit. So the same effect happens because we are not grabbing the full circle of the, of the router bit. Let's just make our forces kind of look like that. So the bigger the part of the circle, the more force is being applied. So we have that much force there and that much force there. That means that this can actually slip again with the same forces that are being applied while it's cutting. So this is a compounded effect. Uh, you know, it can it can happen with the with the inside, where we have a straight shaft, but we have more material down here. That, or up here than we do down here it's it's causing the same kind of problem the other thing with this is the sawdust inside let's just say we've got a nice even distribution of the sawdust inside the collet to the router bit the thing is is that sawdust is scattered around the surface so let's just we're going to cut it in half right here and we're going to look at this side right there so we're looking at the collet inside right here and it goes up like that and it goes over like that and we have specks of sawdust all in here well now what we've done is we reduced our contact area of our clamping area so if we've got a bunch of pieces of sawdust in there we can literally reduce our gripping contact area by 50 to 75 percent because everything's being contacted on these little pieces of sawdust. So with the loss of that contact area, we have less gripping or holding power of the collet to the bit. I hope that makes sense to you. Little pieces of sawdust reduce your contact area and therefore reduce your, your ability to clamp evenly all the way around the bit and sometimes it may be unevenly distributed so you have more pieces of sawdust on this part than over here. The other thing is, I said it before, that sawdust, well let's make our, our crystal structure, that's our steel, and here's our sawdust. Sawdust is compressible but we can in no way, shape, or form make it as hard as steel when we're torquing this nut down. So that has the springiness in it. It's got a compressibility factor that's a hundred or a thousand times greater than the steel does. So that compressibility factor allows this to have the springiness in there that is all part of all this stuff here. And that allows us the drill bit to move because it's just not grabbing as tight as it can. And then we get to one other thing, which is the, the oils or saps that you'll find in wood. So when you have that and the sawdust gets in there and you're constantly squeezing it, it's squeezing out those oils and the saps. And then when you start to run your router, you already know that the router bit gets hot. There's friction. It's ripping through material. And so that friction causes heat. And that heat gets into the router bit. That heat travels up the bit, and it travels into the collet and into the, the works of your router. Well, what happens is that can get hot enough to actually melt that sap inside or in between these contact gripping surfaces. So it can be in between this area right in here, or it can be here and going out to here. 
and it forms like a shellac. And shellac has a lower coefficient of friction. So that means it slips easier. It has lower coefficient of steel to steel. Now earlier I talked about contact area. And that is actually very fundamental. When you have a bunch of sawdust in there, you lose your contact area there, but you also have something else that's going on. If you put a microscope to the inside diameter of the collet or on the bit, what you'll see is a bunch of mountains. It's going to be all jagged like that. This would be the bit the, like this, you're looking at the bit like that, and then you're looking inside the collet like this, and the wall of the collet looks like that. So when everything closes down on each other, what's happening is these little mountains are starting to lock into each other. So now we're exaggerated. We're looking kind of like that. And so these act as little locks that hold everything in place. So when I'm talking about surface area this is a major issue and when you're getting sawdust in there it is stopping that locking ability it's taking up that space so this stuff can't close in close enough together this is why contact area is so important why you want to grab around the full diameter of the circle so here's another issue is when you have a bit shank that is a little too much undersized for the diameter of the collet Let's say this is a quarter inch collet, so it may be 0.253 in diameter, just a little bit bigger than a quarter inch. And let's say your shank on a, this is 0 0.24, uh, 0.2495, whatever. That's actually pretty good. So 0 0.245, we'll say. So it's five thousandths under. And now we've got a I don't know, we'll say eight thousandths of an inch disparity. Anyway, the, the bigger the difference in size, the more potential you have for slippage. And you'll get a good feel for that. When you put this collet on your bit and you try to wobble it in there and you feel a lot of play in your collet, either your collet is worn out or your bit is undersized. So let's just go with the scenario that the shank of the diameter of the, of the bit is undersized. The collet is made for a quarter inch, and we'll say the, this is a 10,007 inch under. What happens when, when the tangs close down on the, on the bit? So these are your tangs, and this is your bit that's undersized. When they close down, they're holding right there, 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 and there and you don't have any locking area there or tight contact surface the teeth are not locking in to the teeth of the bit and so now you don't have as many teeth that are holding the bit in place and so that's why contact is so, uh, area is so important and when you don't have as many teeth it's a lot easier to start to torque the bit and start to make it slip backwards so if the shank is undersized or your collet is oversized, one of the things is your collet can get worn out. If you get too much of this slippage, you'll start to wear out your collet. Which brings me to another point. Is if you've had too much slippage going on with your bit, you can actually get to a point where no matter how tight you make your collet on your bit, you can't get the grip. If you've ever worked with drill bits over a period of time and, and you've drilled a bunch of holes and the bit starts to slip on you and you tighten up that chuck more and more and more and for some reason you can't get that chuck tight enough to hold the drill bit anymore, it's because you've polished the drill bit so much that those mountains are now valleys. So now you've taken this nice jagged locking edges between the shank and the collet and you've smoothed them out like that. And now there's nothing there to lock into each other to keep the bit from moving in the collet. This is a, actually a very common issue if you start getting the slippage. The more it happens, the more you're going to have trouble with slippage. So if you look inside your collet and it looks 
uh, mirror smooth and it feels mirror smooth, then your collet is probably too smooth, especially if you've had slippage going on and you're going to have to replace it. So now you know so many different reasons why this slippage can happen. Really what it comes down to is clean out the collet every time. Eventually, with the constant clamping of changing bits, you are going to end up smoothing your collet out like this. It's just these little mountains that keep getting smashed on top of each other and eventually it start to round out and smooth out. So you may have to just get a new collet and that may be the simplest solution to your whole problem if you keep seeing the slippage issue. Well, I bet you didn't expect that kind of explanation. You just got an engineering level education as to why your router bit slips in your CNC router as you're cutting projects. And the way to get around that is by every time you change that bit, you pull the nut off, you pull the collet off, and you clean it out thoroughly and make sure you clean the inside shaft of your router because otherwise you don't see it. That's just one of those places we don't normally look. If you're brand new to CNC routers, you might want to subscribe because I teach you all this stuff and about designing and about the routers themselves. If you found this video enlightening, give me a thumbs up. I hope from now on that you have awesome projects and that slippage issue never happens again. I'm Garrett with IDC Woodcraft and I hope you have a great day, better tomorrow, and happy CNCing. I'll talk to you next time.